Hello. In this podcast today, I'm hoping to talk about a study in which we've looked at the rates of adolescent self-harm in Northern Ireland. We've looked at the factors associated with adolescent self-harm. And we've also looked, explored for the very first time um, the influence of the troubles, uh, exposure to the troubles in Northern Ireland. To set the scene then, um, the background to the study. Now before we had conducted this study um, a few years ago, there had been no large scale research in Northern Ireland which looked at adolescent self-harm. There have been some small scale studies which primarily had looked at um, hospital treated self-harm, but we had no idea at all about how common uh, self-harm was amongst young people in Northern Ireland. So we took that as our starting point that the aim of the study was to try and get a representative sample of adolescents across Northern Ireland, investigate not just the rates of self-harm and the thoughts of self-harm, but also try and get some sense of what are the factors associated with self-harm. We know there are a whole range of factors out there. Indeed, we based our work on the Child and Adolescent Self-Harm in, in Europe study, which is a standard methodology in which a, a number of countries throughout Europe and in Australia have asked self-harm questions in exactly the same way which makes it um, really useful because then we can compare the rates of self-harm in Northern Ireland with other countries in the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, but also more broadly, and if you look at sort of continental Europe. So that's the sort of background to the study. So what do we do? Well, we were really fortunate that we had, first of all, we had funding support from the Department of Health under the sort of suicide prevention banner. And we also will work closely with the Department of Education. So we're incredibly grateful to both the Department of Health and the Department of Education for facilitating this research. And also we're extremely grateful to the head teachers and numerous senior teachers who facilitated the research. Because without those uh, individuals and of course the young people who agreed to participate, the study wouldn't have been possible. So anyway, what we did was we um, set about recruiting a nationally representative sample so we identified all uh, secondary schools in Northern Ireland and we then recruited 28 of those schools. And those 28 schools is representative broadly of the key sort of indicators. So it's representative of um, ethnic background, of religion, of type of school, of rurality and urbanity, um, of uh, the number of kids who are on free school meals and so on. So we were able to ensure that we had a broad scope a broad brush. So we had 28 schools recruited and from those 28 schools we were able to recruit 3,596 young people. Now we used a methodology which has been used widely in Europe as part of the Child and Adolescent Self-Harm in Europe study. Now we modified it um, for the context of Northern Ireland and also there are a number of other factors that we were interested in which weren't included in the original Child and Adolescent Self-Harm in Europe survey. Now the case study, that's called the case study, and the case study has been used now in a whole range of countries throughout Europe and in, in Australia. Um, but it's worth noting that this methodology has been used in Scotland, England, and the Republic of Ireland. So because we are using the same methodology in Northern Ireland, we can make direct comparisons with respect to the rates of self-harm in particular, and some of the risk factors associated with, with self-harm. So we had the standard methodology to ensure that when the young people, um, when we in this study we're focused on primarily 15 and 16 year olds, that we looked at the 15 and 16 year olds that when they were completing the questionnaires, that the, the questionnaires were completed completely confidentially. So that nobody beyond the research team would have any idea of who was participating in the studies. Okay, so it was confidential and anonymous, and there's a really set protocol that we used. So what do we find? So what we found was that the rate of self-harm in amongst 15 and 16 year olds was 10%. So uh, one in 10 of our young people in Northern Ireland is, has reported that they've engaged in self-harm at some stage in their lives. Um, in addition to that, we know that self-harm is much more common in females compared to males. And we find that again, that the rate is much, much higher. As you can see here, the rate is much higher, three, in some cases, three, four times. As you can see here, the rate of the male to female difference 
in Northern Ireland. And again, that's consistent with, with research which we've conducted in Scotland and, and other colleagues have conducted elsewhere. Um, and indeed, if we look at uh, self-harm in the past year, most self-harm has occurred in the previous 12 months. And again, this is consistent with, with other research because we know that really the self-harm is pretty rare up until puberty, and then it starts to increase as we move through puberty. And we think it tails off um, in sort of in the early 20s. And thankfully, from longitudinal research, which has been published in the last year or two, uh, there's good evidence to suggest that most young people, albeit it's incredibly distressing at the time, it's a marker of obviously incredible um, distress, that most young people cease self-harming by the time they're in their uh, mid to, uh, or early to mid-20s. So in addition to the rate that 10% of young people who reported self-harm, about another 20, 21, 22% of young people reported that they'd seriously thought about self-harm but hadn't um, acted in those impulses. And again, that's, I mean, it's concerning as well because it illustrates another group of people we really need to target in terms of are they receiving the, the correct support and so on. So that's the rates of self-harm and we see this male-female pattern as the majority is female um, and the majority of self-harm has been reported as occurring in the previous 12 months. So if we compare then the rates of self-harm in Northern Ireland to the rates of self-harm that are reported in Scotland, England and the Republic of Ireland, we see an interesting pattern. It's perhaps surprisingly, given that um, if we look at the hospital treated self-harm rates that have been reported from the Northern Ireland sort of self-harm um, registry, uh, the, the rates of hospital treated self-harm in Northern Ireland are quite high. So we would have anticipated that the rates of adolescent self-harm would have been similarly high. But it's clear, though, that the rate of self-harm in Northern Ireland is lower. It's 10% in Northern Ireland compared to 12% in the Republic of Ireland and 13.2 or 13.8% if we compare it to uh, Scotland and England, or in England and Scotland, sorry, because um, that's the rates. Um, this is particularly interesting because, as I say, we would have anticipated um, higher rates of self-harm in Northern Ireland. So that's led us to ask the question, well, actually, have we any reason to assume that the rates of self-harm perhaps are underreported in Northern Ireland. Because it's worth highlighting, and again, if you read the paper, we get the details of how we've asked the question. We ask directly whether the individual has self-harmed, have cut themselves or taken an overdose or harmed himself in some other way. And we know from other research conducted in Northern Ireland, not focused on self-harm, that as a consequence of the troubles or the conflict, that um, perhaps young people in Northern Ireland are much more likely to are much more uh, more reluctant. So we looked then a bit at uh, trying to understand why the rates of self-harm are apparently lower amongst young people in Northern Ireland compared to other parts of the UK and Ireland. So we looked at other research which has tried to look at sensitive topics um, amongst young people. And there's a body of evidence now in Northern Ireland which suggests that as a consequence of the troubles, the young people themselves are much more reluctant to disclose personally identifiable or personal information. So we reason that that 10% is most likely an underestimate. And that's borne out by, if we look at the number of people in our sample who, when we asked them in addition to say whether they'd self-harmed, to tell us or describe uh, the self-harm incident, the most recent self-harm incident, um, what we find is that, that yes indeed, that fewer of our young people actually describe the self-harm episode compared to what the percentages of young people in, in England and Scotland who, who, when asked the same question to describe their self-harm, um, more people in, in England and Scotland answered that question than those in Northern Ireland. So that would support this idea of a greater sensitivity, a greater reluctance to self-harm. It's also worth highlighting that um, adolescent self-harm is primarily self-cutting. So, and this is again, is consistent with research and literature um, in that if you look at studies of hospital-treated self-harm, hospital-treated self-harm is most commonly um, cases of overdose, whereas um, self-harm in the community, especially amongst adolescents, um, is much more likely uh, to be self-cutting. Okay, so where does that take us? Well, it takes the fact that despite the, the rates being slightly lower in Northern Ireland, it still is a, a really important public health issue. So the next thing we did was looked at um, the factors which were associated with self-harm in our sample. So we did this in two ways. 
first thing was we looked at which factors individually, so the univariate analysis, were associated with self-harm. And then we put all these factors then into a multivariate analysis to see which factors were most important. So you can get the details of the univariate factors um, from the paper. There are a whole range of factors, and there are no surprises. So people with uh, past history of abuse, they were being bullied, who were exposed to self-harm, um, coming from more um, difficult backgrounds, and so on. These factors were all associated with self-harm. But if I just focus for a second on the factors specific to Northern Ireland, as I mentioned a second ago, we also looked at, in addition to the traditional factors, we also looked at exposure to the troubles or exposure to the Northern Ireland conflict. And we asked uh, um, five or six questions on this. And what we found was that young people who reported, both boys and girls, who reported being caught up in a riot or an explosion, who had a family member or a close friend who had been injured or killed as a result of the troubles, or if they had been victims of, victims of a violent incident as a consequence of the troubles. Those young people who reported yes to those questions were significantly more likely to report self-harm. We couldn't look in this particular study at the sort of temporal relationship between this exposure and the association with self-harm because we simply asked these six, these six questions. So what we would urge in future research is that we need to look at the ongoing consequences of the troubles on our young people. Because remember, these young people are 15 and 16, were all born after the Good Friday Agreement was signed. And so I remember when we were conducting this study, we were talking to some of the schools, and we'd suggest that we were going to include these questions. I remember a number of head teachers saying, well, why are you asking that? These kids are all post-conflict in a way. And what our data here suggests is, yeah, yeah that's in chronolog chronological terms, that's indeed the case. However, the consequences are long-lasting and the consequences are continuing. Now, when you put the troubles-related questions into the multivariate analysis, they don't emerge as being significant. But I, I would really urge researchers and others interested in this area to look much more closely at these, these data and much more closely at how we may uh, more fine-grainedly investigate the relationship between the troubles and self-harm, not just self-harm and suicide. We know there's, a, it's a, there's evidence that's associated with suicide risk and, and suicidal behaviours more generally. So these um, data, I think, are important in this respect. Okay, so if I return now to the sort of traditional factors which if you look at studies conducted across Europe, um, which have looked at self-harm, um, what we find again is an interesting pattern of, pattern of findings. Now, if I just focus now on the multivariate analysis, in other words, which factors are most important, what we found was, first of all, if we focus on, if we look at girls, the girls who reported alcohol use, drug use in the past 12 months, had also reported being bullied, who had experienced um, lifetime physical abuse, lifetime sexual abuse, had been exposed to self-harm of others, primarily family and friends, and had low levels of self-esteem. These seem to be particularly important factors associated with self-harm amongst our, the girls in our sample, our 15 and 16 year olds. Now again, because this is a cross-sectional sort of prevalence study, we can't make any judgment about the, the direction of the relationship and what's preceded um, which. It's important that we do longitudinal research to try and look at the predictive utility of um, these sorts of risk factors and protective factors in the prediction of self-harm and hopefully then the prevention of self-harm. So that's the girls. So what do we find for the boys? For the boys we find, and, and similar to the girls, we find that bullying was a key issue and indeed exposure to self-harm also, was also. And if I make a general point, not just focusing on the data here in Northern Ireland, but if you, if you look at the work we conducted in, in Scotland and others have conducted elsewhere in the UK and Ireland. Bullying is such an important risk factor, and as is um, exposure to self-harm. And again, exposure to self-harm is one which, again, is really tricky. How, how do you deal with, how do you challenge? And what exposure is, is really knowing other people who have self-harmed. And what we need to do is better understand the mechanisms by which exposure to self-harm increases risk. And we have some qualitative data in this study which you can look at in which we get some indicators of the, the mechanisms by which um, exposure may increase risk. So we see that some of the young people reported, well, if, if it was okay for my mother or father or brother to engage in self-harm, well, it's okay for me. So in a way, it's, it legitimizes it for the individual. 
may also have straightforward modeling effects. In other words, we, we learn our own behaviors often by wa watching other people who are important in our lives. So this modeling effect is also there. And there's also evidence from qualitative data which, that suggests that uh, a sort of functional explanation. So it may be things like, oh, it seemed that um, it helped my friend cope or my brother cope, um, or when they were distressed, this is how they responded. And as a consequence, that individual then thought, well, okay, maybe that might help me. So that's a functional explanation. Or a, another way to describe it is that perhaps it could be that if somebody else is engaged in this behavior, it maybe it becomes a potential behavioral response for you. So the reason we're trying to understand these mechanisms of exposure are, are so, so important is because if you're to develop a strategy, we need to really tackle this. And again, if you look at the, at the data in our study, exposure is such a vitally important, this knowing other people who've self-harmed um, is a really, really important risk factor. It's much more important than anxiety or depression. It's much more important than some of the other traditional risk factors. We really, really need to look at that in more detail. So in addition to those common factors that the boys had with the girls, the absence of exercise was also a risk factor for, for the boys. Concerns about sexuality was also um, evident. And again, that's if you look at the broader literature on uh, concerns about sexual orientation and self-harm and suicidal behavior, that's a really growing literature and we really need to do more about that. You understand it's not the sexuality themselves as a risk factor, it's, but often it's when you talk to the young people, it's, it's, it's the consequences of disclosing that or people thinking that, that, that they have a sexuality other than, say, heterosexual orientation. We really need to look at that in much more detail to ensure our young people are supported and that, um, and that the risk then thereby is, is, is decreased. In addition to that, the young people, the boys, who report higher levels of anxiety and much more impulsivity were much more likely to report self-harm. And impulsivity, again, is a recognized risk factor in this area. And it's not that the impulsivity is contributing to your thoughts of self-harm, we believe, but work that we've conducted um, elsewhere in, in, um, and published in the British Journal of Psychiatry a couple of years ago, which actually included some data from Northern Ireland and combined that with Scottish data. We found that impulsivity is a factor which makes it much more likely, we believe, that if you have thoughts of self-harm, that you'll act on those thoughts. So according to this model of, of suicide and self-harm that I put forward, the integrated motivational volitional model we believe it's a sort of volitional moderator it's a factor which makes it much more likely that you translate thoughts of self-harm into acts of self-harm again we we believe that um, levels of impulsivity increase through puberty up through into uh, adolescence and into the early 20s a final aim of this study was really looking at the motives and influences on self-harm and a young person's decision to engage in self-harm. Um, to do this, we looked at a range of different influences, including the internet. Um, and what we think really systematically for, for one of the first large-scale studies to do this. So what we found, not surprisingly, given we know the influence of other people and sort of the exposure effect, when we asked what factors influenced your self-harm, your decision to self-harm, not surprisingly, the most important factor was influenced, and that's distinct from a risk factor. But when we ask what influenced your decision to engage in self-harm, the vast majority of young people, both boys and girls, reported other people's influence. Okay, so other people who self-harm, that influenced their decision to self-harm. And it's between 30 and 40 percent across the boys and girls, almost 30 and almost 40 percent across the boys and girls. So a really important factor. And in addition, we'd asked about the influence of the internet and social networking sites. Now, Bear in mind, these data were collected about six years ago, and the absolute growth in social uh, networking sites since that is marked. So we believe the influence is probably greater now than it was when we conducted our study with um, our 15 and 16-year-olds. But what we found was that, again, overall, it was about 18% of our sample report that the uh, social networking sites or the internet um, influenced their decision to self-harm. And if you break that down by boys and girls, we find about 15% of the girls reported an influence of the internet versus uh, social networking sites, or sorry, the internet and social networking sites, whereas the boys, it was, it was closer to 26% of the boys reported these influences. So what these data suggest is that we need to look, again, as I noted already, the exposure effect, the exposure of other people's self-harm, but we also need to look at how we respond to the challenge and the opportunity that the, that the internet and social networking sites um, present.
and there's been a lot of work looking at the negative and sort of the negative influences of the internet and social networking sites and, and sort of cyberbullying and a range of other factors have been explored more recently in the research literature. But we need to see the opportunities here as a, a way of offering support. Um, given the anonymity, people may be more likely to seek help on the internet or using social networking sites, but they have to be provided in a safe, safe manner. And the organizations like Samaritans and others are really trying to embrace the internet and social networking sites to ensure that our young people are getting more opportunities to get support. The last thing I want to say then is, is I've touched there on sort of the influences, but the last thing I want to just say is looking at um, the motives. And self-harm historically has been seen, especially self-cutting has been conceptualized in a pejorative manner as oh, it's only self-cutting and, and people try and minimize self-cutting, but obviously we should never minimize self-cutting or any form of self-harm. Indeed, our data bear this out that the vast majority of young people reported that the reason they give, they'd engaged in self-harm was just this manifestation of pain, just they're trying to get relief from, from intolerable pain. So these cry of pain motives tend to be most common motivations that underpin self-harm. And indeed, uh, these so-called manipulative reasons, which I think is an awful term, but we've historically we've used this, but the so-called cry of help or manipulation reasons are very, very infrequently endorsed by young people. They are not the reasons young people are engaging in self-harm. Self-harm is, first and foremost, an indication of extreme distress. And that these young people, for whatever reason, um, are engaging in self-harm. Some actually uh, who've engaged in self-harm say it's, it's a reason for staying alive, it's a, way, a reason to manifest their unbearable and intolerable psychological pain. And indeed, from some of our qualitative data, young people say to, I, it was a way of making the, the internal pain real, making it ex external. Um, because again, we know that internal pain mental health uh, is still stigmatized. And it's what we really need, really need to challenge that. The other thing to say about the motives is about um, between a third and 40% if you look at data from Northern Ireland and from Scotland of young people who report that, um, that they wanted to die. And we need to look at that more, more closely because there's this growing literature on um, dichotomizing self-harm into non-suicidal self-harm or non-suicidal self-injury and, and distinguishing that from suicidal self-injury. And we need to be careful that, that we don't lose sight of the fact that even individuals who engage in so-called non-suicidal self-injury, oftentimes they change their motives within an episode and they change motives between episodes. And oftentimes they're ambivalent about why they've engaged in the behavior. And also we know that even somebody who engages in explicitly non-suicidal self-injury is that they could also be highly suicidal at the same time. So we need to look at the complexity of these different types of behaviors to understand this phenomena, these phenomena of self-injurious behaviors more generally, because they're always a manifestation of pain. They're, um, sometimes they're an indicator or a manifestation of suicidality as well. But we know that anybody who engages in these sorts of behaviors, these self-injurious behaviors, are statistically at increased risk of suicidal behavior and death by suicide in the future. So we really need to take them seriously. Now, but just end then with some general conclusions. Um, I think these data highlight that self-harm, adolescent self-harm is an important public health issue. We, um, sadly, we don't know enough about self-harm in the community more broadly. Um, the data just aren't collected in Northern Ireland and they're rarely collected um, consistently um, in a representative sample, sample elsewhere in the UK or Europe more broadly. So we need much more work on the research on looking at monitoring the patterns of self-harm amongst young people and in adults more generally, as I say. But we need to look, what can we do? We've identified these young people at risk. How do we intervene? And we know the schools and teachers and, and others involved in, in education system are concerned about um, uh, this growing um, phenomenon of uh, adolescent self-harm. So we need much more research looking at interventions, both um, in terms of straightforward treatment interventions, but also on an individual level, on a group level. We need to look at developing much more partnership working with, uh, so to ensure there's a sort of coherent care pathway. Because one of the challenges we hear time and time again is that a young person, yeah, who's maybe 15, 16, and then as they move through 17, 18 into adult services, they oftentimes fall between um, child and adolescent services and adult mental health. We need to be really careful of that um, really crucial transition 
um, in a young person's life. So we need much more um, light shone on this, um, still a Cinderella, Cinderella service. We need much more work, not just in terms of the research, but in terms of the treatment and prevention. How do schools respond? We need much more on sort of school ethos and how one manages um, the death of suicides. And thankfully, Samaritans and others have developed guidelines um, how, with respect to how one manages a suicide death, but also how one manages self-harm in schools as a distinct issue. So there's much work to be done.